Warning. The following contains bright, flashing lights, and slash or imager that may cause discomfort, and slash or seizures for those with photosensitive epilepsy. Viewer discretion is advised. Awesome. Uh... So yeah, how how was your how, how was your crossing down here? How was that experience just crossing into Tijuana? It's it was easy. It was um, I thought it was gonna take hours, but c coming in, I felt something. Yeah, a change. Yeah. Is it funny, like walking towards the border when you get to San Isidro, how you start seeing it kind of change, even on the uh, even on the U.S. side? Yeah. There's like a a definitive change of texture color smell and everything yeah right what is it is a uh, unsupervised dangerous freedom starts being kind of in the environment yeah because in the u.s i mean you're protected from a lot of things and you come into an area where it's just not that yeah, individual freedoms are more you know yeah <laughs> That's why it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's always a weird experience, uh, kind of like seeing people go through it. When was the last time you came down to Tijuana? Um, man, maybe three years. Three years ago? Yeah, to visit my grandma before yeah. she got her papers. Oh, awesome. Yeah. She, was, she, was staying, she was staying here in Tijuana as yeah. she was going through the process. Yeah. That's, that's a common I, story for a lot of people here in Juarez. Juarez, Juarez or in Tijuana are usually places where people wait. And people get visits from their yep. you, know, you know relatives there on the u.s side i was so fed up with her being here to wait by herself i told i was like grandma i'll i'll cross with you yeah and she's like i'm too old i can't i can't do it like that i was like grandma i'll carry you <laughs> okay you're like 90 pounds come on <laughs> we'll figure it out yeah i'll figure it out uh, i mean so we started off with that uh can you uh can you tell people a little bit about you like in uh i mean your name yes like, um, where are you from like what got you here a little bit my name is angel cortez i'm a former army ranger i i spent some time in the special operations community and and i got to go to iraq afghanistan saw a lot of combat um got out now i work for a tactical company and we do more than just tactical stuff do some mentoring some survival skills first aid you know stuff like that it's called defense strategies group we're all former special operations anywhere from and we have some some active duty soft dudes too uh, i'm two classes away from earning my bachelor's in nutrition and dietetics awesome. i own a company that gives back to the community what's the name of the company og pumpkin uh and before all this i used to sell guns drugs um running around the streets caused a lot of trouble and before that i was just a poor first generation kid uh, let, let's uh let's let's uh let's start from the uh the past let's go let's go back to the past a bit so you're a first generation yeah mexicano first one in my family what do you think about the term latinx <laughs> the fuck is that Okay, sorry. I have to. I have to ask. You know, I'm yeah. sorry about that. So you're, you're first generation, um, first generation Mexicano out there in the U.S. Uh, your parents from uh, Puebla, you said, right? Yeah, both from Puebla. Hardworking people. The Puebla, Poblanos are known for this. Be hardworking, yeah. straight. People. I tell you, tell you what, my dad, he had a little bit of a drinking problem, and he would beat us and all this and that. And I'll tell you what, no matter what he did. He was up if he yeah. drank all night and you'd be like this dude is wasted he's not going to work tomorrow he's he, up he's, he's up, up and before you and he's at work working all day it's funny you mentioned corpor corporal punishment you know every now and then in latin community the u.s i hear the term like la chancla or the the sandal yeah it's like my mom used a car antenna i don't know what the fuck you people are talking <laughs> about a sandal right <laughs> the sand you got off easy it's if it a was sandal. a sandal it's a fucking sandal yeah I, car I, antenna i used to get the the snake belts yeah, the yeah. alligator belts yeah get you some of a, that yeah which belt you want pick it <laughs> oh, fuck okay people don't know anymore it's getting a lot it's a lost art you know no it's child abuse is bad but some of us grew up with it and yeah i think uh i don't know <laughs> we could talk about if it worked or not later on 
uh, we you come you you basically for a generation so all eyes are on you as far as them and their dreams about this american experience probably, yeah right the that's pressure all, that's all i heard growing up is you're the first one here we're here to have a better life and i did sooner or later move to mexico and i lived in puebla when i was seven for almost almost two years um but before that, it was just, you know, we didn't have this. We didn't have that over there. You have this. And even though we were poor, but they were like, I didn't, we didn't even have this over there. And they always told me it was up to me to set the example. Um, was there an aspect of guilt that they were trying to kind of, in, uh, kind of push you with? Like, we it, didn't have any of this. Now you have everything that like you should. Yeah, it kind of felt like that, you know? So like, almost like I had no room to complain. So, you know, the situation I grew up in with all the abuse and everything, this and that, I, I wouldn't complain a lot because the way I saw it, I had it better. Wh 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 where did you grow up specifically? In Santa Ana and Garden Grove. Santa Ana and Garden Grove? Yeah, because my parents sooner or later split up. So we did the whole two weeks here, two weeks there, or they would just drop us off at a relative's house in Santa Ana and just be there all day. And then they'd show up at night to pick us up. How old were you when they, when they separated? Young, young, yeah. no, still in elementary. How did that affect you? Like, like for people that don't know, like Mexican family nucleus is pretty solid, yeah. mostly, you yeah. know, like traditional Mexican stuff. Like my, my parents were married until, you know, one of them passed and it's very common down here. Well, not so much anymore, but it's devastating when, 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 when a Mexican kind of like root rooted family like that separates, uh, Specifically far from home where they're kind of may, maybe separated from their normal uh, support uh, structures, right? Yeah. You know, so as migrants. Uh, how was that for you? Well, you need to have a father figure for sure. And when they were together, they, I know they would argue and this and this, this and that. But the separation made my mom's house, you can do whatever you want, you know? Yeah. And then eventually my, dad was, my dad's house was like that too, but... You, you grew up with no male role model. Yeah. There was a... Repercussions were not there anymore. Like yeah. There was a, a whole aspect of like, oh, let's see how far we can take this aspect of it. I get it. Now, I imagine that led you down some... Uh, some bad situations in your youth. Definitely, you know. And growing up, I would see cholos and everything, but I didn't think anything of them. Um... Cause I didn't know who they were. I didn't like know the what gang, they were. The gang culture. Yeah, the gang culture. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew they kicked it in the front. They blasted music, and nobody told them anything. And some of them had nice cars. My parents didn't talk to them. My parents didn't acknowledge them. They didn't bug us. Were there no warnings uh, from your parents about not uh, relating to or getting uh, too friendly with them? No, they just. They, they were they, just part of the background. Yeah, it's part of the background. And sooner or later. I grew to an age where I wasn't invincible anymore, you know, that some of them were like, hey, you with us, are you not with us? And I grew up skating. I, to this day, I still skate. And one of them tried to steal our board. Uh, my friend wasn't going to do anything about it. Yeah. They, they, they tried to fuck it. Like, yeah, they tried to steal your board. Yeah. Fuck. And I, I wanted to do something. Yeah. But um, I knew I, I could not take them on. Right, some of my friends that were with me wanted to, but most of them didn't. And that's when I realized, like, for lack of better terms, like, I like my friends here, but a lot of these dudes are pussies. And I'm like, I need to make a decision. Am, I'm, am I going to let these guys punk me whenever they want to, or do I need to fight back? Yeah. And I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to fight back. And we met some other guys from that school that from, from my school that didn't like them. And I was like, shit, dude, I don't like them either. And next thing you know, you're kicking it. And next thing you know your clothes change a little bit and before you know it, i got jumped in yeah yeah that uh that change now i know what i know later on you joined the military and we can talk about some of the parallels of being jumped in and yeah. that aspect of it which i know there are um but uh you think in a group like that basically a gang you know like back back when that was a like a big thing, you think a group like that replaced some of the stuff that you were missing from your lack of a family nucleus, maybe behind you? Oh, hundred you know? percent. Because at home, 
uh, my dad would beat me, and if I was with my mom, my mom would tell us we ruined her life. Uh, so I didn't feel any love. Yeah. Uh, I didn't feel like I was protected or anybody cared. And then you got this group that's like, hey, come over here, come hang out with us. We'll protect you. They're friendly. Some some of them would feed us. Some of the older guys would be like, yo, man, here's some beer, here's some pizza. And you're like, fuck yeah, I don't even get this at my house. And you feel like you're part of something. Yeah. And growing up, I was I didn't feel like I was part of anything. Yeah. Belonging was, yeah. A, was a big thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. And violence was a part of it as well. Risky behavior. You know? Definitely. And then you have all that anger pumped up because, you know, you grew up fucking getting beat. You grew up with all this, and and at the time I didn't really realize, you know, what it was, but there was frustration from all that. Resentment. Yeah. Anger. Yeah. I mean, some of these things come up later in life, and probably came came up later for you, but uh, this type of environment and this type of childhood produces like a very specific type of individual, right? Um, I don't know. For me, I think it was a uh, risk taking is what I learned from growing up like that. You know? Yeah. And you can take a risk taker into the world and you can go into criminality, you know, which I did some of that when I was a kid. Or that you can go into focusing that uh, risky behavior into something else. Now, now, for you, like growing up in that environment, you know, growing up in the whole gang thing, um, you know, I imagine violence was around. I imagine crime, <laughs> crime was around. Yeah. You know, what type of trouble would you get into? Well... Violence was always around me. So even though as a kid, before I was even in a gang, I wasn't part of it. I mean, I, the first body I saw, I was still a child in elementary. I don't, I don't know the exact details, but I know it was gang related. So you see people fighting all the time. You see, you know, rumbles in the middle of the street. So, uh, dead body. Like, what was this? What was this? How old were you? Like, where was this? Like, 10, no, 10, 11. Draw by and I remember my family members saying like, don't look at it. Don't look at it. Somebody and, just lying on the ground. Yeah. And the cops were already there, and, and they were all trying their best to, to block it off and, and all that. But As you're, So you're 10, you see their first dead body somewhere in your neighborhood. Yeah. Um, everybody's trying to block off the view of it, not, uh, not acknowledge it, tell you, telling you to ignore it, to be yeah. far from it. You know? Yeah. That's an, inter- uh, that's an interesting reaction, you know? Like um, growing up in Mexico, you know, you see that. And I don't know. Is it, it death isn't fo- isn't a foreign thing here? Like it's something you're like, oh look, you know, that's what's gonna happen. You know, yeah. this is a different, you know, a different thing like, reaction we get down here. Um, so you see that. What does that do to you internally, mentally? Like when you think back on that, like what do you think changed? It was the it was the beginning of of maybe losing my innocence as a child because the funny thing is i wasn't even looking at it and wasn't even probably going to see it until they're like hey don't look at it and i'm like don't look at what as as soon as as soon as they tell you not to do something like well let me see exactly what they're trying to i was like okay well people die here and then you know little by little i'm I'm paying more attention because at the time i was just in my own little world in my own head skating but you know when i find myself in there you know none of it was new violence Coming my way and me producing violence was n- nothing new. That it did escalate in 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 ways that I never thought. You know, I joined so I wouldn't be messed with. Yeah. And what you, I, joined, you joined for respect, backing, protection. Yeah. You wanted to feel safe in this environment. So yeah. Safety in numbers, basically. You know, people can understand that motivation probably. But there's a cost to that, probably, right? Huge cost, and I learned that right away. So I joined. I started hanging out when I was 13. By 14. I got jumped in and by 15 I got stabbed and and I got stabbed on my head and in my back and that's when I realized okay this isn't just about protection anymore clearly there's a whole new level and somebody taught me that and because of the way who, and who I was I was like all right then so then I got bulletproof vest started getting guns and because so, I, so somebody trying to stab you to death basically yeah uh was not successful no yeah and then you started to wear body armor and now you're up in the game and getting guns now to not get stabbed yeah. is that kind of like the process you went through as far as a reaction to that experience yeah and of course i was angry 
Uh, and you got the peer pressure. You got the, all the testosterone in you. It was a uh, was a uh, retribution, a big part of the after of that event. Yeah. Like, hey, we're gonna get these fuckers back. And you had to. Yeah. Because that's your this word. Is, it's your name. Do. It's everything. And I started selling drugs as well. But and I'm not trying to justify it. But I started selling drugs to feed my brother and my sister. Yeah, Be- what type of drugs are we talking about? First, it it was just weed. You know, was- and. And what people don't understand is that back then, weed what isn't what it is now. Yeah, yeah. Now you go into a store and now, now weed gets gets trafficked from San Diego into Tijuana. It's yeah. fucking mind blowing. Yeah. And back then, I mean, there's a lot of people in jail doing big numbers for weed because yeah. back then that's not, that was not the case. Yeah. So we knew the risk, and you know, it, it was around the same time when right before I got stabbed, I, I started seeing. You know, all the older guys having money and this and this, this and that. And I saw them sell drugs. And I'm like, I want some of that, you know. But every time, uh, once it started selling, I just started taking my brother and my sister to the mall and telling them everything that we were denied, we can have now. You know, I know some of the listeners may not understand this. But, I mean, everything, any name name brand I had growing up, that was my friends letting me borrow clothes. All through high school, I, I used friends' clothes that, that they let me borrow um, you know, I, I grew up with hand-me-downs. Yeah. So to us, that was a big thing. Just having a pair of vans was, was huge. Um, eating. Now, now you, you're, you're doing this illegal activity, you know, selling drugs or whatever. And you're giving that to your family. Like the experiences that you didn't have. Yeah. This is how you, were you in a way trying to justify it? Doing stuff like that to yourself? I, I, I know. I, mean, I knew, I knew it was bad. Yeah. Um, but I, the, those are the cards that I was dealt with, so that's what I played. But, but as soon as I could, I got a job. Yeah. But I made more money in one night than I did two weeks. <laughs> I worked for a, uh, I won't name the company, but uh, I helped ship airplane parts. So anytime they would come that in. Was, that was your first job? Yeah. And so I would work a legit job. You know, every two weeks I got paid, and it felt good. Working hard, earning that check, it felt great. But tell you what, on a good Saturday night, I made more money than those two weeks. In a day, in a in a night, yeah, and that felt even better. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a weird trip, you know. Uh, so you're you know, you're selling dope on the side. Yeah. Um, you're doing this job to try and now did you take that job to to because you were trying to figure out an exit. Of uh, 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 you know, as far as that life or no at 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 that time no it's just. I just wanted to do the right thing as many times as I could. Yeah. You know, and, so you're and basically trying to find your way a way you, you you didn't envision yourself being there forever. No. Of course my actions said yeah. otherwise. <laughs> and then especially once I started getting older and being in charge of my own crew and I went from selling just weed to the crew as a whole we sold e coke um you know weed I I personally never sold coke because I don't like the hours. Yeah. And my friend within the crew, uh, he sold the coke, and I'm like, bro, like, you're getting calls at 2 a.m. Man, I'm not, I'm not yeah. trying to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I tell you that. There's no, there's no right time to snow, you know. <laughs> um. What uh, what changes? Like, what pulls you out of that? Well, a lot of things. Um. Every time I would smoke weed, some people, you know, I mean, I mean, of course, I would smoke weed and like giggle and, and maybe get the munchies and this and that. But more often than not, it's, it was just it would tell me exactly what I was doing wrong. It would it would give, I couldn't deny it. I couldn't escape it. I was high and be like, bro, you know, this is wrong. You know, there's no future. It's a, it's a so you would get the whole uh, internal conversation yeah. aspect of smoking marijuana. Yeah, that's a bad one to get. <laughs> So you would uh, so you'd smoke weed, and instead of relaxing, you would start talking to yourself. Dude, yeah. what the fuck are you doing? Is what that... are, yeah, what are you doing? And I would look around, and I, I would see him like, dude, some of these dudes, they're, they're not me, and I'm not them. And that's cool that you want to be down but for the hood and everything, but you don't, you don't care about anybody. Uh, man, in some ways you don't even care about the hood because if you cared about the hood, you would want to make the hood itself better. You just pure, maybe maybe evil is not the right word, but 
there's something wrong with you. I, I would see dudes who they sold drugs too and they were great and you know at it and had money and will call like Pizza Hut, order a pizza and just jump the dude just for the fun of it. And then take, take the pizza, take his money. And I remember like sociopathic shit. Yeah, like for what, dude? You have a fucking pocket full of money. Yeah. And um, and I, I started controlling my crew, right? I had my own crew. And at that point, uh, we were we were in charge of like 90, maybe even 100% of all violent crimes that came out of that area. Uh, you hear me say that I wanted to feed my brother and my sister. It's true. I, I did have a job because I wanted to do the right thing as possible. But I became good at what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and one day my friend's like, you know, you're our unofficial leader. You know that, right? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I figured I kind of knew the and a lot of the older heads were now going to prison. So I'm moving up in their ranks, you know, and, and things things went from brawls to maybe stabbing to now, you know, I get shot at. We shoot back. You know, now instead of just the 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 business and and fights being city, now it's now we're going county to county. What was your EDC back then? Like what you carry? The thirty-two. A thirty-two. Yeah, thirty-two revolver, and I had a uh, police issue vest that somebody stole from a uh, uh, soft armor. No, no, like, like a, a serious like, legit like a, vest. Like a, like a blade arm, blade armor. Yeah, some some cop had taken it off for whatever reason kind of just threw it in the back seat scoop scooped <laughs> and it was from a beach city so i won't say the city but you know in those beach cities there's yeah. not a lot of crime so i can imagine if that dude just took it off and was like all right i'm taking this off Snatch. the That's... window you know window was cracked and he got jacked yeah um yeah what what uh you know what was what, what was the defining moment for you to say you know what I need to stop this and find something else. Well, because I was about to turn 17, right? So it's and, serious now. You know, yeah, you it's, fuck up, it's gonna, serious. Yeah. And, and a lot of people are going to jail, you know, and then homies who I thought were, were scary, you know, they're not untouchable. Yeah. Nobody's untouchable. And yeah, they're going away for long stretches now. Not just that, but getting shot, surviving, but now they're, now they can't walk straight. You know, now, now they need, a cane consequences and then and then a homie died who was cool he wasn't from my hood but we all kicked it because it, it was a one way in one way out and in, in the apartment complex and a, you know it's apartment so anybody can just move in whatever and he was from a different hood but you know he we still considered him a homie and one day he he somebody walked by where we were kicking it and he's like did you hear and i was like what happened and he's like he like you know so and so's dead and i was like what the Dude, he was just in my house yesterday. What do you mean he's dead? Like, yeah, he got shot in the head. And I'm like, fuck. And I'm like, all right, man. You've been saying you can't do this forever. You got to get out. Yeah. And some, some people ask me all the time, like, how is it that you got out? You can't get out. Well, and I tell them, well, it was easy. But it's easy because in the position that I was in. And at the right time, some older heads went to prison. I'm in charge of the crew. We have the majority, the mass majority of guns. We are the violent section of the gang. So I got them all together and I was like, hey, look guys, this isn't right. Yeah. We gotta get out. Like there's, we, we can make money. Now we're, now we're more about making money, right? We weren't really about spray painting walls or repping anything. Now we're making money. Like, hey, we gotta get out. There's no future. I mean, most of them agree with me. A few of them kind of fought back. They're like, hey, man, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, man. And he's like, I don't know. And I was like, well, I'm doing it. And I'm telling them. And I told them. And when I told them, people who I thought were going to be cool with it were the ones who had the biggest problems. And the people who I thought were going to give me the biggest problems were like, we yeah. see you, man. We see what you're doing. Go do your thing. And it was, I want to say it was the most violent time ever and that's when i was involved in the most shootings and the most everything because just because i said i got out doesn't mean everyone else who we've been beefing with was going to be okay with yeah and but i told the crew i was like hey anybody who doesn't want to leave us alone 
there's no fighting there's no punching back and forth is they die or we die and that's how it's going to be and that's what we did and some of us some of them were like okay cool and some people fought back and they got they got what what came to them you know i mean yeah. at that time of course i was said fuck it man that's what you get but now they were caught up in it too so you start making your way out it's not easy well not, it's not uh it's not a delicate process um what do you do next like you're you're out of it you're gaining distance from this whole lifestyle well one day one day the SWAT team raided four of our houses all at once and I thought that was it I was like fuck like we were on the way out we were like we were out but we were on the way of out and what happened was you know people aren't supposed to go to the law that a lot's what that's what a lot of people pride themselves in right fuck the police this is this this and that well something happened and it was funny because for two weeks I had I did have my everyday carry which was a 32 but at that at that time we had more yeah. we had everything but I was in front of the house with the bulletproof vest you know ready for everything for two weeks on edge just waiting and waiting and it never came and it was because they went to the cops and they went to the cops SWAT raided our homes our homes uh, they took a bunch of stuff um, they were trying to make you know their case and this and this this and that uh, but I learned a long time ago, when I was doing all this stuff I was being as smart as possible I've always been a big believer in and if you're doing dumb things be smart about it uh, I took CSI classes because I want to know what they were doing what they were looking for anytime we did anything major I uh, I would get rid of all the clothes uh, I remember one time my friend had brand new Air Force Ones and I was like give me those shoes and he's like really and I'm like dude everything everything, everything goes head to toe everything goes you know the drill and that's your fault you decided to wear that you know the protocol Go. So they came, they raided our homes. Yeah, they found stuff. They found drugs. They found money. They found this and this. But it's not what you know. So what can you prove? Yeah. And everybody went home at the end of the day after that. It was scary because you don't know that. That's right paranoia. It's yeah. Fucking paranoia. It's fucking kid. That's a, it is a, just wondering. Yeah. You know, wondering what they know when they're coming. That yeah. type of aspect I, of it. It's torturous. I, th I thought we were done. I'm like going to jail so but it didn't happen nothing happened nope and yeah. i wanted to join the military i always did i looked up to them because like i told you i would get high and i'm like dude this is the wrong thing you got to get out and i would look at a uh, national geographic specialist on special operation guys and i'm like that's what that's that's is what you're that, looking is, for is that is that where the uh the idea got into your head like uh to join the military like well, you don't have any role models in your family in nope. that regard no so but, like a foreign concept for you but all of a sudden you see this national geographic thing and you're like i want that i want to be like them there but i've always wanted to be like that even so, since i was little i remember when 9 11 happened i remember thinking like fuck like i felt bad because i couldn't go over there and help and do my part the way i saw it is this this country has helped me has helped my family and I joined for a lot of reasons, but one of them, it being 9-11, another reason is because I was born and raised on food stamps. Yeah. So the way I saw it, it was the country took care of me. Now it's my turn to take care of the country, do my part. And then obviously, of course, the guns, of course, the brotherhood, of course, the, the testing yourself. The, the testing yourself aspect of it. Uh, I mean, like somebody like you that went through that experience when you were young, there was a lot of testing going on. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now you see this uh, new challenge in front of you uh, through the military, and then you just go. Yeah. Like, what, what branch did you join? I joined the army, and uh, I had this little like spiel that I wanted to tell the recruiter, and I was super nervous, and I was like, and I said it all fast, and I was probably stumbling, and uh, and I was like, oh my my name is Angel Cortez. Uh, uh, I see that IEDs kill a lot of soldiers, and 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 I want to do something about it. I want to go after the people, or I want to go find them, you know. Uh, um, and this the recruiter looked at me like, chill out. <laughs> okay, bro. All right. First of all, you're going to join for sure. And, and then they're like, he's like, all right, you can either be EOD or combat engineer, right? And uh, 
I wasn't really good at school besides math and PE. So when they told me like, yo, this is the pipeline for EOD. And I'm like, oh, for sure. I ain't making that. Like, yeah. Fucking, I hate school. <laughs> so I went combat engineer, the, the combat engineer route. And, and, you know, I went to, uh, first I got stationed in Washington and, uh, Washington state. So I get up there, regular army unit. And they well, tell, well, how's that feel? That sudden you're, you know, you're doing shit somewhere shady, you know? Yeah. And now you're joining them. You know, the army is kind of shady too, but in a different way. Yeah. What was that? Uh, what was that? How was that change for you? You know, it, it was first. At first, it was a huge culture shock. Because when we went, when I went to basic training, I don't, I'm not sure if they did it on purpose, but like everybody that was from a bad neighborhood was in that platoon in that company with me. So like you had dudes from Miami, from Florida, uh, not, not Florida, uh, New York um all of these other states that i had never met like poor poor white people i always yeah. thought poor people were only you know mexicans yeah. and they're like yeah man we got fucking gangs too we got all this and that and and you're like oh shit you know i went to, with uh what is it is it little rock the city yeah but he's like yeah he's like i was i was uh charged with murder but uh i was found innocent I was not convicted. Yeah. And the, I guess he had the old fashioned story of the judge told me, Hey, you want to go to, you know, cause he was caught for other stuff. And he's like, all right, I'll so go. You're, you're seeing people from different parts of the country, different races, different yeah. backgrounds and everything like that. But you realize it sucks for everybody. And we're all here. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I even went with, with some dudes, uh, in boot camp. They're like, you know, this is my first time seeing an Asian. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> they're like he's like the population you know of my school is all white yeah well the people some people out there that might be laughing at that aspect of it poverty means staying in one place and yep. not experiencing the world basically yeah. or people outside of the world like i mean i've I, I i go to a different state every weekend mostly when i travel around and i get to experience a lot of a lot of the u.s and a lot of pe different types of people i can imagine going to some of the poorer communities even in the u.s and just people just growing up and just not experiencing uh the, the you know culturally what is available yeah so you have kids there in the army with you who has never seen an asian person before yeah <laughs> and a lot of them never had mexican friends like i had dudes who we're like, you know, you're my first Mexican friend, you know? And I'm like, oh, shit, dude. Like, I'm sorry. Did you apologize? For <laughs> no, I was just like tripped out about the whole thing. Like about, cause it was my first experience for a lot, right? It was my first time seeing snow. I'd never been to the mountains for yeah. what you can, you can, I can barely travel out of the city, you know? Um, and I, I respected everyone. So I never had an issue with authority. Uh, I did have issue with like my peers because the way I saw it was like, dude, you haven't done shit. Like, why should I respect you? And so in boot camp, I did I did get in some fights, but like I said, we were all troublemakers. So like, there was a bunch of fights. There was a bunch of fights every day. And then towards the end, you know, we're all becoming friends because we're going through this experience. And for a lot of us, was the most the the, the peak of our struggle in life. You know, physically, mentally, we'd never been tested like that. Um, so that for sure there was a bond after that and a lot of us were cool and we all went to our separate units and by the time i got to washington they're like hey man in four months we're going to iraq get ready four months they just gave you the number four months like how did you get ready i mean i, I imagine the training and everything but like mentally and like what were you thinking about it's like four months i'm gonna go to a very active yeah place i mean yeah the, in the hood you have gunfights but that's not the same no. over there they're putting bombs in the roads for you they're putting bombs in the walls for you they're putting they're making the donkey that's walking by a bomb yeah. you, there's if there's a dead body don't touch it because there's probably a bomb in there so it's different it's, it's also you're not you're not fighting for where you live or with people that speak the same language or necessarily you know will go and maybe eat at the same corner food store yeah. or something this is overseas yeah this is an unknown enemy in a big way with an unknown language to you uh, that wants to kill you Yeah. in any way, shape, or form possible, including blowing themselves up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people might think that your background might have prepared you for violence, but this is 
This is next level. This is yeah. This is a this is a different dimension to that type of violence. Um, so four months. Uh, do you do you talk to your family after after this uh this, this news? Do you talk to your uh, parents about I'm going over there? You know. Yeah, I I I told them right away. You know, because um. They were they were all wondering when are you gonna go? When are you gonna go? And, and I told them and. And they were like, okay, just listen, listen to your sergeants and all that and do your training, do your best. And the day before I went, I remember my, my grandpa was, he was like the father figure in my life. And, uh, and my grandpa was a kind man. And rarely ever did I ever, ever see him be angry, yell or anything. Poblano too. Yeah. yeah. And I'll never forget, he told me in Spanish, you know, uh, He's like, when you do what you have to do, you hear me? And then, and then he's like, here's your grandma again. And that's all he said. You do what you have to do. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm coming home for sure. You know, or for shit. You, at least you think for sure. A lot of us think for sure, right? When we don't come home. That's what I mean. We we can we can wish upon a star. Yeah. Wishful thinking shit. I, yeah. I, I did a few of those for sure, in my past. I understand. That. Uh. So, are you carrying them with you when you leave, basically? I'm like, oh, these people, I'm, you know. In a way, I think Mexicans have this more than other cultures. I don't know. I think so. But we, there's a weird responsibility that we have as far as our family members and stuff like that. Like, oh, I'm going to do this and all of these people are behind me. And I need to do good because because all these people are behind me. Yeah. Uh, so, you go out there. Like, where, where, was, your, where was your first deployment to? to Iraq, uh, a province called Dailala province. And I had heard all the stories from all the older guys, you know, how the fighting was. But when we got there, all of them were like, this isn't nothing, this isn't nothing. But even then people were dying, people were getting hurt. But they were like, a lot of them were like, this isn't nothing. What, what, was, what year was this? Oh uh, nine. Oh nine. So it wasn't nothing to what happened before basically is what they were saying yeah right it was yeah. like it, it's not that bad in comparison to the, the initial that was really bad yeah right and um but yeah like you said i i did have my family behind me and i told my brother and my sister like yo you know uh, this is gonna help us and and all the money because you make extra money when you're deployed all my money i gave to my family the only the check i came with was the check they gave me days before we flew out um, I used that money actually to pay for my sister's culinary art school. Awesome. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And because uh, the way I saw it, I mean, they gave me a room, they gave me clothes. Uh, what do I need this for? You know, and I told them like, yeah, I'm doing this for us. Yeah. You know, we have we have nobody. And at the time, yes, my family was changing. My, my, my parents weren't who, who they were. And they as human beings are growing. But I was like, no, nah, this you just we just have us. That's it. You know, and I'm in charge. Not in, nobody put me in charge, but I mean, I felt like I was in charge of them. So you're so you're out there deployed. It's not that bad, they say. Like, you know, what's going through your mind is walking out there. Well, it's like going on another planet. Like when people say, "Oh, I'm going to another country," and this and this, it doesn't do it justice. I think it's more like going to another planet. Like. Going to another country would be like going to another state because you can't tell me New York is Miami, Miami is not Washington, Washington is not Southern California. Might as well be d different corners, you know, of another, you know, it's a different country. Yeah. But when you go to an, a country like Iraq, it's like another planet. They don't speak your language. Nothing there is familiar, how they dress, the smells, what they drive, nothing. It, it's... It's crazy. It's crazy. So you're just over, overwhelmed with the uh, with the unknown out there, basically walking around. Uh, death, you say death is there. It's just not that bad, or at least not that bad to the people that are the older guys that are uh, yeah. cycling out or there to receive you. Uh, when does that uh, wake up call kind of come, come, come get you? I think it hits everybody when they go out there. Suppose. Um, like well, when I got there and I and and I knew it was it was kind of serious it was, so almost one of the most chill days ever and i was going to have dinner and we got mortar attacked and then you know the people who play call of duty know exactly what i'm talking about and like about five or six landed super close like 
it landed and, and it hit somebody in the neck, that soldier died right away. My friend took some to the neck, some shrapnel to the neck, another one took it to uh, the ribs, and then I was right behind them, and I got nothing. So I felt the force, uh, people are dropping, it's loud, everyone's trying to run to the nearest cover, and I remember they were trying to work on the soldier that was dying, but they, they, they were gone. Yeah. It was a huge fucking hole. Blood everywhere. Neck. Just huge, just yeah. gone. But it's not your first time seeing that, but it's your first time in war in war seeing and that. you're like okay you know now did you think it it uh it affected i mean your experience effect made you react differently than the people around you seeing that for the first time maybe in their lives i was i was just more alert yeah. if anything you if know? anything you're just more yeah but i was like that running around the streets because you're walking i didn't have a car so you're walking and you don't know if you're about to get jumped you don't know about to get shot so being on alert I was, I'd, I've already been in that state. Yeah, condition, My, like a condition yellow or a condition yeah. red, basically. Yeah. Which people that might have not gone to experiences in life, that's a very exhausting to, way to kind of go about life, you know, looking around. But in a, in a war zone, I mean, that is that is your state. You have to be in that kind of state. Oh, definitely. So somebody gets, a, you know, somebody gets a hole open up in their neck. There's blood everywhere, shrap metal mortars are now part of your life that's a new add-on there yeah <laughs> your new normal um death is there you know it's always been there for you in, in some way shape or form as far as your background but it's new uh is it was it was it because of the what's the difference there like seeing somebody die not it's not a gang related thing anymore Although it kind of is, because you're a gang too. Yeah. You're out there doing gangster shit as the, a country. You the know, biggest gang in the world is the U.S. government. <laughs> so you're you're with this new gang out there. Uh, how, what changes after that little initial event for you? Well, the biggest thing was that you're not in the hood, so you're not on drugs. You're not angry, in like in that particular way. Um, everyone wants to go home, right? And after that, I can tell some people were scared. Some people weren't ready for something like this. Some people were already like, you know, shell shocked right away. I knew I could take it. That because I did. I wanted to be like the guys who were fighting right before me. I'm like, do I have that warrior spirit in me? You know, can I take it on? Because one of my biggest fears was that things would happen and I would freeze. Yeah, and I would find out that, dude, you're not a warrior. Yeah. You don't have that spirit in you. I think everybody going through something like that have that, like you. You have those dreams of your gun not uh, functioning. Yeah, right. Your rifle not failing. What to do. Not knowing what to do. <laughs> like impo you're an imposter. Yeah, I think it's common for anybody that goes into a situation like that or like risky situation like that. So you wanted to see if you were like the people that inspired you to be there, basically. Yeah. And. Um, it's wild. It's a wild to think about. You're you're out there. Um, what happens next? Man? I mean, you're you're there the, for his deployment. Death is there already. Like the deployment was kind of slow. We we did have um, during elections. There are elections because the the terrorists don't want there to be some type of government control and and, and some type of actual structure in society. You know that's you know controlled and regulated. And so they're blowing each other up during elections um you know more death uh seeing seeing a van drive by and get blown up because they were going to go vote and they were putting bombs on the way to the to the polls you know so they're like keep people away yeah so we go back and when i joined the military I mean, I was small. I was a malnourished kid. In, in, in boot camp, while well, a lot of people were losing weight, I was gaining weight. You were, so, getting, you were getting regular meals now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Yeah. So at that point, when it, from that deployment, I, you know, I'd, I'd been in for almost two years, uh, well, a year and a half in the, in the military. And, and physically, I was also building myself. And one of my mentors is Hugh Vanderwall. And he took me in under his wing and Who, who's he he is he was a team leader not not my direct team leader but a team leader within that company and and you know uh, to this day i'll ask him like what made you want to you know 
guide me and teach me and he's like dude i saw i knew you were a troubled kid but i knew you wanted to change i knew yeah. you wanted to learn and i can work with that because there's people that don't want to change and don't want to learn and so he was he was that guy he was he was that he was that but reference where you're there basically yeah. and uh man i'll never forget going inside his room and 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 he would have a library of books you know of 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 like art of war and stuff like that and and here i am 18 and he's trying to pour all this information in me and and i'm just like dude you're, you're and he's young i always tell him like bro you got like the wisdom of a hundred year old you know japanese yeah you know fucking because he's half japanese half, half american yeah. uh, white um and and i told him i want to i want to go be in special operations and he's like you can do it and He's like, you can do it. But when I had voiced that to my actual leadership, they all laughed at me. Yeah. They all laughed at my face. I'll never forget it. I just had to stand there and take it while my team leader and my squad leader and my peers just laughed at me. They're like, you think you can do it? You know, and some guys from our company had gone and they were studs, physical studs. If you yeah. look at them, you're like, that dude's a stud. Yeah. And they would go not make it come back. And, uh, that bugged me out i remember going home and feeling sad and angry and my hugo was like dude brush it off fucking yeah, don't listen to that shit. don't listen to that shit you can you can do it so i started getting physically prepared for it and what would you do to get physically prepared for it like so for people that have never you know yeah so at the time there was there was more unknowns right nowadays there's there's on blogs and people like that right now they could yeah. talk about it right bunch yeah. of podcasts a bunch of training programs back you can then get. All you, all back then all you had it was like hey i heard this hey i heard that was that it yeah exactly so i would just run certain lengths because i'm like who okay i'm gonna run 10 miles today and and then i would have a backpack with like 65 pounds on and then i'm like okay today i'm gonna do 18 miles so i'm rucking yeah and to, and the next day i'm only gonna do four but i'm gonna try to run it as fast as possible i had no idea so i just prepared the best that i could and my leadership was seeing this the higher-ups um and they're like hey man i know you want to drop your packet but we're getting ready to go to afghanistan this time and we're going to be attached to special forces and i remember thinking like bullshit we're not going to be attached to special forces yeah and next thing you know i started seeing the special forces guys coming around our area their leadership talking to our leadership and what was happening is in afghanistan they're having this thing called village stability operations or vso yeah. so they would have an oda team with, and for the listeners who don't know a, a special forces team doesn't isn't like a, a regular infantry company or platoon like they don't have 36 guys in the platoon and their oda they got you know i've seen to teams as little as eight people on their team so they wanted to supplement the that oda team with infantry guys me being a combat engineer the the way they decide is like hey we're gonna take some of our best combat engineers put them attach them to an infantry squad and then that squad will go with an oda so then i got sent to an infantry company got attached to an infantry squad and we went to uh eastern afghanistan or yeah eastern afghanistan wardak yeah. right Ward, wardak province and like how i said right before the iraq deployment i said i, I wanted to be tested or i wanted to be in a firefight i wanted all this you know all the younger the older guys were like yo man this this trip wasn't shit i got everything that i asked for plus more it was heavy yeah. right now there's dudes with we made national news three times uh guys who i was there with have been on other podcasts like like sean ryan's yeah um they've been given ted talks yeah. There's books written about it. This this was basically a, a this was a, a a time and place where people were made or or eaten basically. Yeah. Is what you're saying uh, because of the 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 sheer amount of energy focused on just achieving stuff there. Yeah, it was. I dealt with suicide bombers, um, cleaning up brains off trucks, uh, waking up, running out of my room with my grenade launcher, my rifle thinking we're getting shot at but it's like no you're just walking up by gunshots because that's happened so many times that your brain just thought that's what was happening and your homie's looking at you like knowing exactly what's happening and they're playing hacky sack right outside and they're like no nah, dude just 
Yeah. You, 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 in a way, you asked for it, and it was there now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. Digging, uh, digging up bombs with my bare hands, you know? Every, we got everything. Yeah. So, you, how old were you at this point? So, at this point now, I'm in charge of men, too. So, now, I'm 20. I'm a sergeant. 20-year-old sergeant in charge of humans. Yeah. To not get shot. Yeah. Get blown up. Your responsibility. Yeah. It's fucking wild, right? The responsibility you get placed on this 20-year-old. And if they could see you only a few years back to... <laughs> bullshit you were into yeah you know did you, get, you, did you ever think about that the think, aspect of that like man if they only knew you know i, I think about that all the time you know, now that i'm more open about what i you know my past and and i've been on some podcasts pe people who who i went to iraq with were like dude i didn't even know yeah i had no idea yeah you know <laughs> um and at the time i didn't talk about it yeah. i, I don't want to talk about it you know because not only was i representing I was representing, representing Mexicans yeah. in the military. I was, I was represent, representing people from Southern California, you know, because one thing that I learned is that you're representing something to somebody yeah. everywhere you go. When I interact with people, they, they might just see me as a veteran. And so I'm representing veterans. When I meet other people in other countries, when we're cross training or whatever, I am representing the United States. And and then the, in the Army, one thing that I noticed is I was representing first generation mexicans i had this one dude come up to me and in the military you make the most fucked up jokes all right you're, you're used to it that that's that dark humor that gets you through all the bad times through all the death and everything and so you don't know sometimes what's a joke and what's real and i remember one of the guys being like man you know what man for a mexican you're not that bad and i'm like ha 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 you know laughing and then he would say it again and then like within like about three months after one day three months pass and he's like hey man you know how I would say that for a Mexican, you're not that bad? I was like, yeah. And he's like, I wasn't joking. And I was like, yeah, I figured. And he's like, I grew up. He's like, I love my dad, but I grew up. And, and he said that you guys just come here to rape this country, take, abuse it. Um, I had no idea. You know, I, that's what I was taught. Yeah. And uh, so I knew I was representing... You're taking responsibility for who you are and what you represented, basically, yeah. every time in these interactions. That's a powerful thing. It's a fucking powerful thing. Uh, that's a lot of weight also to put on yourself, like a like a ridiculous amount of weight too, you know. But it, you know, that's it's a very Catholic thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, people don't realize that in a combat zone like that the people that are with you are even more than family at times yeah. because of all your suffering uh through uh sleeping in cramped environments suff the, specifically the suffering through shit with people yeah um, you know shared suffering it definitely develops a bond that is very powerful um i mean i i've lost people when i was working in some of the operations groups that i worked with that I knew for like a few months and I miss some of these people more than I miss people that I knew for years, you know, it's a small amount of time, but it's concentrated time with people. They don't tell you about any of this. Nope. There's, there's no, no, there's, there's no, no training. Pamphlet. There's no training, no, no pamphlet like that, uh, about, uh, grief loss. Um, a warning about the tr i mean probably recruiting would be bad and yeah. harder if they had to warn you about all these things uh about a transformation that happens to you in a place like that you know oh yeah uh what you lose you know and what you gain you know there's there's, a, there's you gain things from it oh definitely and i'll i don't regret anything i don't regret anything that happened you know of course i miss my friends i miss them I think about them almost every day. You know, you got Memorial Day and, and there's a day we all think about them, but guess what? Memorial Day for some of us is every single day. And I had a lot of anger from their death. So that when that deployment was over, I'm like, I'm dropping my packet. And because I was, I was part of the special operations community, but not in it. As in, I didn't pass the selection process, but I saw that special operations gets more than the regular units to take it to the enemy not wait so i dropped my packet 
uh, and for ranger assessment and selection process, which is the selection process to become a ranger, I made it. Um, and at the time, I didn't know if I was going to make it because I, I, I didn't grow up an athlete. I wasn't some high school superstar, you know, football player. Self-doubt. Yeah. We're Mexicans. You yeah. know, this is uh, anybody that is out there listening to this was Mexican. We fucking doubt ourselves every day. You know, huh. we well, how can I do that? Yeah. There's something like uh, something of that kind of like built into us from an early age. And so, so you, you, yeah, I can't do this, and you're doing it. Yeah. And so when I went through the selection process, I remember looking around, and and I mean, you can even see most of the famous special operation guys that are out there. They're monsters, right? All the, the guys physically, the physical yeah. specimens is what you're saying. Like yeah. Big, big, big dudes. Yeah. Look, look at David Goggins. You know, Addy Stumps is big. You know, Mike Glover. Yeah. Name any big name out there, and you're like, yeah, did. Of course, he's in special operations. Yeah. You know, look at Tim Kennedy. Of course. Yeah. And then uh, you look, you look at me, uh, and you're like, nah, this dude's yeah. not going to be in special operations. I mean, I've seen some of the uh, Fuerzas Comando competitions in South America. Yeah. And the guys that win it are never never look like Tim Kennedy. They're always these <laughs> short dudes, you know, that can yeah. do a lot of time with a rock on their back. That's the Colombian guys are the ones that win it every year. You yeah. Know, the special forces uh, competition. So, but I get the the. The perception of somebody like us are like, look at what looking at these big guys. Like that is exactly what makes it. But you know, you're you're here. You know, yeah. you did it. So, I remember these two huge dudes were like uh, right behind me, and they pointed at me and the guy right next to me. And we were tiny, right? And he's like, look at these two. They think they can make it. And I remember looking at them, just just again taking it because I had nothing to my name. Besides that that deployment, I had nothing to my name. I, uh, I had no trophies, no nothing. But I wanted to give it a shot. I, I wanted to go for it. I believed in, in myself. And two weeks later, those two dudes were gone. And I was still there. And one thing that I learned in my Afghan deployment, but it didn't really stick to my head until the selection process to become a ranger, was seeing so many people dropped and realizing that mental strength goes a long way. Yes, you need to pass the physical requirements but if you don't have that mental strength you're not going anywhere i've seen plenty of superman looking dudes freeze in not just war but in life in, in, in life and and just give up so i make it um and my time in that unit was amazing i i got to be with some amazing human beings the great leaders not just with tactics but in life uh, my first uh, section leader was Celis Christopher, you know Celis Chris Celis, and he actually just won the Medal of Honor. And I did my my time there, but I never got to see war or or attack the enemy the way I wanted. You know, I, when I got to that unit, I lost a lot of friends. Not a lot of people knew you know knew what I just come from. I just wanted to go back, and mm -hmm. I knew killing more people wasn't going to bring my friends back. But at the time, that's all I wanted to do. Was that was uh, basically you wanted to prepare yourself better to go back and could we say retribution was a big uh, yeah. motivating factor for you? Oh, yeah. yeah. Retribution against who oriented it towards where? Towards the enemy. Yeah. But who was the enemy? Like, it's an interesting aspect Like for me. Like, I, I never went to Afghanistan or, or Iraq. Um, but I was in, my, in in the conflict that I was a part of. We were told what the enemy was and who he was. You know, yeah. Like, who were you? Who were you, who was the enemy to you? They had no face, right? They're it's just faceless. the Taliban. The, any anyone who wants to shoot at us, dude. Well, you're the enemy, and watch. You're gonna you're gonna get it, yeah. right? But the war was not necessarily that the war was dying because there's always been war. There's yeah. war now, and there will always be war. It was it was winding down. Yeah. By this the, point, what it was is that the you know elected officials were were making us fight with one arm behind our hand and not letting us do our jobs you you can't win a war by trying to make it pretty and put it in a nice neat box with a bow on it that's not war a, a lot of people don't know this but war is not black and white there's a lot of gray yeah and things that you would think that the good guys don't do or would never do well if you're trying to win you gotta let us just do our thing and they weren't doing that 
I so, mean, this is this, you're 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 finding a war, a ge- your generation fought a televised social media war, yeah. which is a it was a whole different thing. You're you're trying to fight, um, you know, the Taliban, and also look good look good for the cameras, and also nation build, and also a bunch of a bunch of people didn't want to you know oh. You don't want to. You don't want to see this violence going on around here. Like, yeah, shut that off. Yeah, you know, po- politics involved in that. Oh yeah, and I was like, you know what? I'm getting out. A bunch of people. A, a bunch of us at that point had already gone out. There, we were tired of what was happening. And when I got out, it was time to go home. It was almost a decade in the being in the military. Twenty four months overseas. And my wife, my wife, uh, she's from. I met her. I've known her since I was seven years old. We're both from Southern California. It was time to go home. We'd miss a lot, you know, birthdays. How old were death. you? How old were you when you were twenty six? Twenty six. Yeah. It, it, uh, so half of your twenties are gone in this war. You're coming to the realization that you know retribution and war fighting and all this preparation and all the stuff you did to get to that point. You know, you're, but you're done. Right? Yeah, and it was weird. It was weird because I remember when they gave me my papers, my you know that you're out. It was in the hallway. the The guy who was he was supposed to give them to my leadership, but I just happened to be in the hallway, and he's like, "Oh, here you are," and then he's like, "Here," and he's like, "You know, good luck," and I was like, and I was just there in the hallway by myself, and I'm thinking. What well, now? And I went home, told my wife, I was like, hey, we can leave now. I mean, we just had to clear our, our house um, because we were living on base, make sure that they're done with. Um, and it was time to go home, and I, and I didn't really have a, a serious plan. I knew I was going to want to go to school. When you say it's time to go home, where's home at that point for you? Southern California, you so know. Time to go back to SoCal. Yeah, time to go back to SoCal. So I drove from. This is a place where you would visit every now and then, yep. like uh, during holidays and stuff like that. But it was you, you would get glimpses of what it was. Yeah, you know? you know, every time you would go, I would go visit. It's every other year, you know. My mom's looking older, you know. My my brother and sister are growing up. Relatives are dying, you know. So. It's what I thought was home, right? But at that point, yeah. the last time I was there, it's not who I am now. So it it did feel different because now I'm walking around in the streets where, you know, I used to rob people. Where I remember looking at that corner and be like, that's where I got stabbed. And then look at another corner like, that's where I stomped that one dude out and broke his arm because he kept blocking his face. Cause, yeah. So I broke his arm. So not only is the home that you left changing, changed. You changed though as well. Like yeah. you're you're not that dude anymore coming back to it, you know. No. So yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, my mom would say a lot. You know, there's no going back home really. Either you change on the way back to it, or the home changes while you're gone. Definitely, and and both happen. So I started going to school right away because obviously I'm a different human being at that point. I didn't have a a, a serious plan, but I knew I wanted to to go to college because at that point now I got other little cousins and and nieces and nephews and and I wanted it to set the example continue setting the example continue the path that I was that I was on I wanted to constantly be improving as a human being as a father you know as a friend and I went to college because no one in my family has gone to college when I graduated with my first degree you know my AS and it was such a big that's a huge family members came you, you would have thought they all won the lottery yeah and my mom told me uh because my grandpa had died you didn't get to see i didn't get to see him you didn't he didn't get to see you graduating though no he he died when i came back from my deployment so he, the last the last thing he knew is i was at war yeah. and uh it was weird because I came home and my mom goes, you know, you're the leader of the family now, right? And I was like, yeah. And she said it with all my aunts there. So yeah. now all my aunts who, who, 
you know, of course, they're still older than me, but I grew up. They were old. They were the adults. Yeah, but but, they don't, but people that don't understand our culture. Yeah. El hombre de la casa, the man of the family. That was your grandfather. Yeah. He's gone now, and all of a sudden, like, it's you now. It's you. Yeah. It is tú. Te toca. It's your turn. And all my aunts agreed. Nobody said no. And so that was my driving path to to being better. To 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 continue but war war has a thing that when it touches you and even if you don't know it it's it's gonna come out yeah it, cha it, it uh there's an alchemy in it and yeah violence changes you in ways that will continue to surprise you even years after yeah like the the the, the, the whatever process of change happens in war in my experience doesn't stop when you leave it no you know I, I i get that i would had trouble sleeping you know um i would wake up and, and and feel like i had to be ready for something like something was coming for me and uh, uh the, the a state of uh there's things that left undone yeah there's, uh there's stuff that i need to take care of uh conversations at night with yourself uh you know uh, I, um, I mean, if you've been in, if you've been in, in any sort of conflict where gunshots or gunfire, or things of that nature are around, like noises will be triggering. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, and my wife was super supportive throughout my entire career. She never gave me any shit for anything. I missed the birth of my my first my first child, my second anniversaries, birthdays, all missed. She never told me. She never gave me shit. That's an amazing woman. But now, now I'm not leaving anywhere. Yeah. And I realized really quick that I wasn't that great of a father. I was a good army dad. As yeah. in like, I leave, I come back, we go out for dinner, we have fun, everything's great. And then I leave again. But there's now- no, There's no escape anymore. There's you, can't, no, you can't hide. No. And I'm looking at my own kids being like, what do you guys even eat? Like, what do you, what do you like to do? You know? And You're just meeting them, meeting them for the first time, basically in a way. Yeah. And sooner or later, uh, you know, and not that I was trying to be a tough guy, but, but when my friends were dying, you know, I never cried because when there's they, no time, there's no time, there's no time, but now, now I got all the time and this, everything started coming out and I started having issues and next thing you know, I got out so I could be wet. more time with my family. Right. Yeah. But, and in, in, in the outside, I was killing it. I was going to school, getting A's and B's. You know, I trained to compete in, in Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu, so I was still training, you know, um, at Classic Fight Team and Raw Talent Boxing, and everything was great, you know. With these pro fighters, I don't have their fight IQ, but physically I can keep up yeah. with them, push up for push up, punch for punch. So I was doing great. Yeah. But in the inside, I was. I mean, you have more. You're, you're not at war anymore, so you have more time to process everything again. Yeah. Like uh, the alchemy of it, it. Uh... Things that happened over there are still affecting you now. Oh yeah. So you're you're out of it. You're doing great things for your for yourself. You're reacquainting with your family. But the stuff that is festering is festering. Yeah, and it all comes out. And next, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm about to get divorced. I'm I'm living on the futon at my aunt's house. Uh, our education benefits pay us also not just for the books and tuition, but they give you a nice housing allowance. But that only applies when you're at school. So in yeah. between semesters, you got to find work. Yeah, I'm working at a yogurt shop. I'm asking my aunt, can I have five dollars so I can put gas in the tank to go work at a yogurt shop where I'm getting yelled at? So you're, 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 holy shit. So you're, you're, you're coming from this whole experience and now you're, you know, there's nothing wrong with working in a yogurt shop at all. Like I'm not saying that, but that is where you are now that that does that probably does a number to yeah. you mentally you know yeah i remember being on that futon being thinking like dude what the fuck are you doing man you you used to be a ranger you used you were in special operations you had a house you had your family you have nothing now you're yeah. you don't see your kids your best friend who's what was the issue like can, can i ask no no yeah yeah it was it, it was was it was it because uh, i never dealt with anything a big so, so quiet you were quiet about shit. Yeah. You didn't confront stuff. You did you was there any anger, substance yeah. abuse? Oh, there was a, all of it. And there's a lot of anger. I was angry. 
I was confused. I would because I, I couldn't go to sleep. I would. I used to drink night. I would. Go, I used to go to Costco, get the the three pack Nyquil, down almost half, and just like finally, so I can just sleep. You know. Yeah. So um, I imagine alcohol was a uh, no al um, alcohol. I never really liked alcohol, and I can. T I would assume. Where, where, where did you pick up that Nyquil trick? Uh, I got sick and 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 uh, I took some Nyquil and I was like, oh, I remember like I slept real good. So and you just got to. I was like, I want sleep. OD on it. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go to sleep. So so a big aspect of PTSD or just yeah. coming back from a conflict zone like that is people don't know this the, the 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 pain behind the sleep deprivation aspect of it the fact that you can't sleep yeah you're just constantly just droning on overnight so your poison like my poison was the alcohol like i get shit faced until yeah. i died mentally and i could sleep right no dreams just dead sleep was nyquil doing that for you basically yeah because I could finally get some nice rest and sometimes when I would sleep during the day I, I know some vets that they hear a noise and they panic or they just walk around and they're panicked and some of them are lost uh -huh. and they'll never be found because they're they're just so lost from war from their experience right on the outside I look like everything's normal but in my sleep is when it would all attack me uh -huh. I would tense up I would shake I would I would wake up nothing nobody's attacking me but i would just wake up and there's there's little movies and parts that kind of get it right and you can tell when they get it right like i'll never forget uh sicario and the part where he's sleeping on, on the airplane and then he wakes up when i saw that i was like somebody told him that yeah because yeah, somebody shared that with him because that's what that's what happens to me yeah you know and but i wanted to deal with everything and so i was like look man you're in a hole you're in a, in a mental hole and I got to get out. I can't let this be the end of me. So I'm like, and, and it took me a while to realize what it was, but I had lost my purpose. I had lost my community and a man without a community and a purpose is a lost man. It's a lost man. That's uh, that's Jesus in the desert. That's uh, you know, that's the shamanic experience when he, when the, when they would send him, would cast him out into the forest alone. Basically, that's where you were in the forest. Yeah. So I had to find, find my way back, right? And I was like, okay, I lost my community. I lost my purpose. Community-wise, I started inviting veterans uh, from my martial arts gym and from my school uh, to my house. Uh, I went to start to go see a therapist. I took started taking CBD. Um, started talking to my friends so from school who were also veterans. The, so the therapy aspect of it, why not before? Why What, what got you into it all of a sudden? Because I it didn't was, want to lose my family, you know? And, it, was and it, Did somebody recommend that to you? Or was yeah. it like you just said, like, therapy it is? Uh, one of my friends, he was, a, he was a ranger as well. He got shot. Um, he got shot up when he was in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, we, we started opening up and talking about our problems and, and, and maybe how to deal with it. Because in the special operations community right now, people um maybe it's gotten better but like you didn't talk about any of this it's a stigma yeah it's a stigma no one it's talks a, about it that's we it's a sign of weakness if you yeah, talk about 100 percent. like man, culturally also mexicans like we'll go to the hospital when we're dying yeah <laughs> so, so uh and there's a stigma with anything you know oh what are you struggling with something yeah are you weak yeah are you local you know yeah yeah so so you had somebody basically recommend that to you or describe that to you as far as their process. And it's like, well, maybe, yeah. maybe this is an option for me. And so I started doing that and I got my family back. I got an apartment and I started inviting them veterans to my house and I would buy the, the UFC pay-per-view and I would, I would get food and beer for all of us. And we would just all come together. Right. So, so you, so you started creating something you were missing, the community aspect of it. You don't, you don't have it. You create it. Yeah. So just I just charge of that. Yeah. So, and everything went great. And at the same time, that's when this is when I got into social media, right? I started sharing some of my combat footage and, and, and it started getting a bunch of views and likes. And, and next thing you know, people would message me and it was basically the same message. I'm like, Hey man, no offense, but you're small. So how did you do it? Yeah. How did you enter 
special operations. Yeah. And I would tell them, you know, and, 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 and I was also going to school, you know, for, for nutrition and dietetics. So I would also share nutrition advice and I would share all my knowledge and, and, and you know, and, and my downfalls of the military so they can have a better experience. And I started growing a following. And then one day my wife's like, hey, I know these events mean a lot to you, but we got to stop doing them. We're going negative into our account. We can't cover our bills. Oh. And I'm pregnant. I, I got, we got the third baby coming and we can barely do it with two. And she yeah. was right, but I wasn't going to stop doing yeah. it. So with the small following that I had, um, a bunch of people would send me like who were friends would send me like t-shirts and stuff and I would share them and people would be like, damn dude, is that your shirt? And I'm like, nah, it's my friend's shirt. You can go buy it at their, you know, page. And people were like, dude, you got to buy it. You got to make your own brand. Yeah. And this was the thing that, that kicked off OG pumpkin. OG pumpkin just like born, right? Yep. It was born out of that. My, my five-year-old son drew the logo because if anyone who's seen my combat footage, you've seen that I have skeleton gloves or a skeleton bandana. Yeah. I've always liked Halloween. And there was a close connection of war, me being in all skeleton out fighting in the mountains of Afghanistan like that. And when my son made that pumpkin, I'm like, that's a connection. This is going to be the logo. Yeah. And, and if it kicks off, then, then I got something. So you were, you were sharing some of your experiences. You were becoming a reference point on social media voice for like people like you that might, that might've thought this was an impossibility, you know, uh, you don't realize that there's potential for a business aspect to it. And then, then there, all of a sudden there it is. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a it's a thing it kind of produces itself from from your experience and from what you've been through and at this point it's it's huge it's bigger than what i thought it was be um people know they hear what i've what i've done what i'm doing for the community um and they support it they love it we i have almost almost 500 people with og pumpkin designs tattooed on them yeah uh, I, I i i i skimmed through your social media and i saw like a like a a grid of everybody like the, the tattoos that yeah. have inspired like how, how does that how does that feel like you know this 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 icon that you just brought forth because of your experiences and yeah. how people are putting that on their skin it was it was crazy because i just wanted to fund the ufc events at my house <laughs> So when I started making more money than what th I needed to cover it, I was like, what do I do? So guys who were trying to be in special operations, training gear is expensive. Our military boots almost cost $200. And if you're a poor high school kid or college kid, you don't have that money. So I would buy, I would vent with them. I would be like, hey, send me a picture of your contract. And I would make them do something silly so I know the contract is real and they're real, right? Yeah. Um, and then I would vend with them the money. And then and then I started hosting, uh, I call it Vehicles and Tacos uh, Ranch Day. So I buy a bunch of vehicles and I get a taco guy, which is my dad, to come and host the events. We shoot to and from the vehicles. Um, and it's another thing because not everyone likes the UFC, but almost all veterans like to go shoot. Yeah. So my core group who saw, who was first just at my house watching fights, I brought them to the vehicles and, and, and talk was range and then I started making more friends that way and giving back to the community are these basically these are mostly people coming back from their own yeah uh, experiences in war and stuff like that that are like you detached or feeling the amputation of a group or people or support network around them yep. after making the transfer into regular life you know yeah and this is what kills people you know yeah. this is this is what ends people that, yeah that process of I'm no longer in the military. What the fuck am I going to do with my life? So this is this is the space where you're trying to grab people and help people out through your A hundred percent, which was then that gave me my purpose. So then I had my community, I had my purpose. And, and next thing you know, I'm dropping off food at food banks but where as a kid, I used to wait in line. Like, what am I going to get? What backpack am I going to get? And what clothes I'm, I'm going to get? Now I get to do that and give yeah. it back. And... People would see this because anybody can sound and look cool for 10 minutes. Yeah. This is why I like long podcasts because you can't bullshit yourself in 10 minutes. Sooner or later, in two or three hours, the you comes out. Yeah. So there's enough hours of me out there. There's enough videos and pictures that 
of me that people are like I like his mission I like what this guy stands for and they got it tattooed on them and it's and mind blowing. the first one I thought it was crazy I was like damn that's crazy and I actually had my appointment that same week so I thought it's gonna be him and I and then and then that's it right because it was a it was a kid whose name was also Angel his dad who was a firefighter he's like hey we live in San Diego Angel has seen all your YouTube videos um, he wants to talk to you. He wants he wants to join the military, and I was like, "Hey, man, you, I actually had an event at my bo at my boxing gym, Raw Talent Boxing, because the the uh, Chewy, who's uh, like a brother to me now, yeah, he would he would close the gym out, and I would just have like a taco guy, and I would tell people, hey, come and let's just come hang out here.' And so the kid came, I talked to him, and and next thing you know, he went and joined the, joined the military, and he was doing great things, and he's still doing great things, so. He got it, and then I got it, and I thought that's where it was going to end. Yeah. But then the more podcasts I was on, you know, like Mike Glover's with, with Fieldcraft, Andy Stumps, um, Mike Ritlin, uh, JT from, from um, Black Rifle, the message got out. So yeah. then more people were doing it and, and getting it tattooed because and I, cause I called it a design, just keep going. And if you look at the design, it's, it's the ghost with the backpack, and it looks like he's hanging life because... The guys who've been in that moment know that feeling of, fuck, it fucking sucks. You want to give up or you think this is never going to end, but you just keep going and you make it. And, and that builds you as a human being. Yeah. But I also said that like, hey, man, life is tough. And and I, I know it can get dark. And, and sometimes you don't think it's ever going to end this period that you're in, but you just got to keep going. Yeah. And so it had those two meanings. The next thing you know, cops are getting there, firefighters, special operation guys. And it's crazy. So you, you you develop this icon. You become this reference for a lot of people that uh, think that something's impossible, but it's, you're, you're, you're there doing it. You know? Yeah. You're, you're, um, you're giving back to your community in a big, ginormous way, and you're constructing what is missing, which is, you know, that's a powerful thing. You know, community. If you're right about community and purpose. It's... You don't have those three things. No. It's a lonely place. It's a lonely place. And along the way, I met a core group of people because that's what I was looking for, right? Like people see the UFC fights and the in the shooting out of cars. I just want my community. I want a core group. And I met I met Michael Dowd, who's a former Navy SEAL, who started Defense Strategies Group, which is the company I work with, and then Benji Mandebog, who owns Thrash and Ray, which is their T-shirt. And I skated. He started a skateboard company. Um, and now we all work with defense under defense and before Mike started started defense strategies groups so DSG I just had all this information in me that I was never sharing yeah you, you have this insane life experience training uh, and the experience part of it is pretty important and lessons to show the lessons to, to teach people you know so yeah so then I, we started working little by little with cops and SWAT teams, you know, and, 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 and federal agents and, and even moms who've never shoot firearms. We have a wide range of classes. And one day, Mike, Mike's the one who's really helped me become who I am right now in this portion of my life because he's like, Angel, he's like, you need to talk more and share about your experiences. Yeah. He's like, when you talk, you have people are hanging on to every single word that, that, that you're saying because not everybody has done what you've done yeah there's not a lot of people there yes is there a lot of people who've been in the gang life yes is there people who've been in special operations yes is there some veterans who've gone out and and gotten degrees and had some sex in, in academia of course but i don't know anyone else who's done all of that yeah and he's like you have to share it so i started sharing and i would share with cops things that i would do when i was a criminal yeah and and talk to to the younger crowds of, of of not just veterans but people from from neighborhoods and and that's how i met benji you know benji uh he was a former marsa guy he ordered he he made thrash and raid happen and we started working together to the point where where i consider him a brother yeah right because i first met him he sp he sponsored a charity event where my friend had died because that's another thing about war. You get out, but the war continues, and your friends who are in, you think they're going to be okay, but yeah, they're, they're dying too. And the one of them. The war's raging. Yeah. 
my friend died. He sponsored the event, uh, uh, the charity event, and I went and to Virginia, which is uh, they actually the charity event is called Hero Games, and they're gonna have another event in, in Bedford, Virginia, July 16th. So I won't be there this year, but last year I was there. Um, and he's like, hey, aren't you from Southern California? I was like, yeah. And he's like, hey, that company's from Southern California too. I reached out to tell him, you know, thank you for for sponsoring this event. And and we met up and the thing I like about Benji is because he was like me in so many ways. He had a, a childhood just like mine. He entered special operations. I mean, well, he didn't have a childhood exactly like mine, but he was a troubleshooter yeah. in his own way. Yeah. Right. A and, skateboarder. Yeah. Which is a weird aspect that kind of links a lot of us. Like I, I, I grew up skateboarding. Yeah. You know, generationally, that's our thing. That was our thing that we grew up with skateboarding. You know. And. And he's not just a skateboard company. I mean, he he's doing what I'm doing on the other end. And for example, he'll he'll have skaters, veterans, and 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 active duty guys come to a retreat. He'll pay for the Airbnb. He'll take them to cool skate parks because SoCal is known for skateboarding. Yeah. Right? He's got a bunch of famous skate spots. And then at the end, they'll have like a not necessarily a therapy session, but a talking session. And a lot of these veterans don't get that because yeah. they're either scared. Or, or, or they don't have a place or they've been to it and the actual therapist that they unfortunately they got assigned to isn't the one to make the connection to, so they make something like yo man f fuck therapy yeah right so we started working together and mike one day tells me you want to go do ketamine i think you should do ketamine yeah and i mike Obviously, like I said, we were, we were working together. I'm gaining that trust. We're like becoming like brothers. So when he first introduced it to me, I wasn't ready. Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways, I was scared. Yeah. Beware on beware unearned wisdom is something that uh, that is said about uh, trying some of these things. Yeah. And and he's like, hey, it's a professional place with 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 professionals. You you you're gonna do ketamine, high doses of ketamine, um, and and there's therapy before and then they call it the journey and then the therapy after and he was saying he had done like six of these sessions right and mike is a a great human being he's so kind but he would tell me stories on how he used to be and that didn't make sense because that's not the mike i knew yeah right getting in fights and bar and in, in bars and, and and having like road rage episodes yeah yeah, c controlling aggression, rage, uh, yeah. anxiety, explosiveness, um, unresolved shit, basically. Yeah. And, yeah. And like I said, you know, I, I I started OG Pumpkin. I was doing all this and all of this and that, and and things were great, but I felt like I was missing something, right? Some. So I looked at Mike and I was like, all right, I'll I'll go do this, this you know, psychedelics, all this stuff. And the first session. Of, uh, I think I did 90 milligrams of ketamine and when I woke up uh, I felt like a tear and then and then I started blinking and then I felt more tears and at one point I had started crying yeah and I went home and I told my wife I was like she was cooking and I was like look I was like stop I was like she was cooking and and, and I didn't say stop in a meeting or anything but she can tell something was up with me and I was like hey just stop for a second just and I was like I realize we're about to be married for 11 years and the version I've been lately is not the version you got uh, I failed a lot as a husband as a friend um, I'm sorry you know I I, I, I realize this and, and I can tell it hit her hard you know it hit home and she was like there was things I wanted to tell you but I didn't want to just tell you the words I wanted you to feel it and you know and that helped me feel it. I, I went to my children and I told them like, hey, you guys don't understand, but I've missed a lot about you guys' life. And this summer, I want to get to know you guys. I want to get to know what makes you, you, yeah. you know? And my oldest, my son, I always had, knew we had a distance between us. And he started crying and he goes, he goes, I'm, I'm happy that you're saying this. And I was like, dude, Sometimes you forget that because they're kids, you think they're dumb, but they're not. No, they're, they're always they're always on. They're smart, you know. And uh, and my and and that changed me, you know. So. 
there's different versions of me, you know, and where people have met me, they might think that's who I was, right? When I was in the military, I wasn't the best version of myself. You know, Celis died and 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 the ranger who got the medal of honor he was my first section leader so when i got out i and when i got out and and then after a while and then he died i remember thinking like i should have been there yeah i was his number two survival survivor's guild yeah and i cried and and celise celise was the first one that i cried for as soon as i found out he, he died you know because back then I wouldn't have done it, you know. This is this is who I was, but now I'm more free. Yeah. And veteran, and some veterans say, I don't want bad things to come up, or I don't want this or this or this or that to come up. And I and what I say is, the quality of life that you have right now, which just probably isn't the best because you're not doing anything to address it. I'm telling you, you're gonna feel a lot better. Will you cry? Maybe. Will you think about some stuff that you don't want to think about? But it, you're going to work through it. And you have to do it. Because if not, you're, you will forever. It's going to fester. Fester. It's not going anywhere. You got to do it. You know? And Because sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll wake up and I'll have tears. And I'm thinking about all my friends who died. My friends who, who, who I wish I was there to help. You know? And maybe that's just me working through it because for years I just fucking put that shit down and never let it get to me. Yeah. Um. So that's if any if anything that 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 I get right now is hopefully if I can just get one person to be like you know what I'm gonna go to a professional place I want to go do this ayahuasca thing or I want to go do this ketamine thing or or hide whatever dose of whatever because I just want to help wherever yeah i mean I've, I've done some of that myself it, uh, people who have been following me on social media probably witnessed my very public uh struggle with alcoholism and i think a lot of that originated from an experience i had um with me it was uh mushrooms um like i went uh i went back old school you know yeah um and uh it changes you I mean, there's a reason why our ancestors used to do them. Yeah. And, uh, and specifically how a lot of the people coming back from a war back then would go on these uh, spirit quests or on these tribal group uh, celebrations of a sort where they would ingest these things. Um, and they're very powerful. I think it's an interesting aspect of the rediscovery of some of these processes that we've been going through, you know. Yeah. And culturally here in Mexico, the only thing that I had available to me was alcohol, you know? So being able to let go of that after, after my experience with, uh, with, with, uh, looking within, which is, I think it's a big aspect of, of that and why it changes people is that we are trained not to look within. We're trained to look outside and figure things out and be safe and target people and be predatory and do all these things and be, uh, dehumanize uh, the enemy and all these things and all of a sudden you were asked to stop yeah turn that off there's no turning it off no. and uh looking within after something like that is fucking <sighs> so i understand some of those aspects um this uh you know be before you got here i posted a video of you people can go on on instagram and kind of see it if they want later on after they listen to this uh, of you handing out skateboards, skate decks, like Santa, yeah. like Santa Claus. You look like Santa Claus. Right? <laughs> like, a, like a very uh, like a very Mexican Santa Claus. You have these loads of skateboards, and um, kids are crowding you. Like I used to be one of those kids. I grew yeah. up skateboarding in Tijuana. Didn't have a lot. I mean, I, I remember when Tony Hawk visited Tijuana. He was yeah. at the Parque La Amistad, and it was like, whoa, mind-blowing. It was everything, right? So you're there handing out skateboards and the thing that comes out of your mouth is, I, I should have brought more. Yeah. Which is like, <laughs> for me, out of <laughs> witnessing you there, like we, we don't know each other that well. But I saw that whole aspect, I should have brought more. That's, that was a powerful thing to say in that moment. Um, skateboarding. Um, and then what, uh, you know, what, it, what type of kids and men it produced, the culture. 
Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, and as, as far as, you know, we are part of a sh instructor community, shooting community, tactical, whatever or other. And skateboarding is, as a culture, as an undercurrent, is very prevalent right now. It's because of people like us that yeah. are like currently in where we are in this uh, in this weird ass game of social media and, and influencing and having companies and training. Like, what was that for you? Like the skateboarding aspect of it. So, like, skateboarding was in my life. Even when I was a game member, I would skate, and some of the cholos would be like, bro, you're making us look bad. Stop skating. It's a weapon. You're carrying your fucking <laughs> weapon with you. Yeah. Um, and I skated in the military, too. But uh, one day, I, I rolled my ankle at the skate park, and then uh, I fell off during a run, and my section leader was like, what are, you, what are you doing? And I was like, my ankle hurts. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, skating. He's like, we're getting ready to deploy. You should probably take this more serious. So I stopped skating seriously, but uh, I always had a board. And when I got out, I, I did start skating. But once I met Benji and I had a friend who skated heavily, I started skating again. And we started talking like, yeah, dude, like we had similar situations in the military where we would skate, but sometimes stop because we got we would get hurt. And what it is is that if you grew up in the 90s, skateboarding was huge yeah, yeah that was everything. everything i mean think about it you have tony hawk pro skater the game you know tony hawk pro skater 2 you have um these insane companies um doing great things and crazy things all over the world um it's such a you have the, the show viva la bam right yeah. Pre, bam with jerry he's got a he's got a uh show where he can do whatever he wants with his friends and and he's a skate pro skater. You have Rob Deerdeck, who's got that fantasy factory, right? Um, so we grew up in that. I, I, I get how skateboarding is not that big right now for the younger generation, but I think it's coming back because so many of us are doing this in other sectors. Yeah, the iconography, we... the style, yeah. the uh, the urban side of it. Like my, my first, I used to carry around an MP5 in an urban environment. Yeah. My first uh, backpack that I would carry it in uh, my mom sewed on sewed on Velcro to a Spitfire backpack. <laughs> that was my first concealed carry backpack for a sub gun, you know, yeah. Spitfire. Um, the first time I ever picked a lock was to break into a pool area that they had a cartel house that was somewhere here in the city. Um, my my clothing brand, Sneak Reaper Industries. Yeah. It is a wink and a nod to world industries you know, <laughs> because that's what I grew up with. The other people yeah. didn't know. Um, but yeah, I had I had this moment in life. I used to skateboard at La Bandera. La Bandera is a skate spot. Where I'm actually, after this recording, we're going to go over there. Yeah. I'll show you, I'll nice. show you that place. And if people want to see some of that, they're going to have to look at your uh, social media. You're going to uh, probably film some content out there. I used to skateboard there yeah. when I was a kid wasn't that good of a skateboarder but i would you know try i would hang out with my friends most of my friends skateboarded too uh they would have a military base there's a military base there and i remember you know, hearing them play music really loudly randomly i never figured out what it was and later on i didn't skateboard anymore but i had that still in me you know yeah i remember my operational uh, shoes were Airwalks, Vans, <laughs> Edneys, Globe, you know? Yeah. All black, you know? That's what you need. I haven't. I remember having this uh, surreal experience of being inside of that military base uh, and seeing some detainees getting processed in there and me wearing my skateboarding shoes and looking down at them and them putting the music at a really high level so drown out the screams of some of yeah. these people you know so i then i realized what, what was happening inside there um yeah but that uh, that whole aspect of skateboarding is, has big big influence and I, I i i dig seeing that influence still kind of around for people of our generation you know, oh yeah it's pretty cool it's it's gonna be with us you know forever and before I forget when you because that park that that video is is at is is santa Ana skate park right yeah and and i i i, I go around in in my military in my cry uniform yeah yeah uh with the kit and um because i thought it'd be funny first my um mike is always making fun of me because he's like dude you dress like a skater at the range 
So one day I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to be all kitted out. I put the helmet, night vision, kit, everything. And I went to go skate. Yeah. And when I did that, everybody, all the kids had fun. They liked, they liked it. And when I realized is that, uh, more people in certain areas were open to, to listening to what I was saying, because I wasn't just some brown tattooed dude. I was a dude in a uniform and, um, that was skateboarding. That was skateboarding. So it's like, wait, yeah. how, how is this possible? Yep. And then especially when I go to places that are, are, are heavily, you know, influenced by gangs, I, it, it makes the whole situation more chill out. Like for yeah. example, because think about it when I don't have the uniform on, I'm, I'm bald. I got tattoos. Uh, I drive a limo on hydraulics, so they're like, "What the fuck is this guy, right?" But if I roll up in the uniform, one, the, that barrier is broken down immediately because what a lot of people don't know is that even people in gang neighborhoods respect the military, you know, because they themselves have an uncle, a brother, a cousin, a grandpa who served. So one, they're not going to give me any crap uh, uh, because of, I'm in a uniform. The kids are more willing to open, and the younger generation they look up also to the guys in the military so it makes the whole thing easier right i don't have to deal with like some cholos trying to hit me up say you know if i bang or whatever the kids or and everyone else love it you know they see a dude in uniform skating i only have all and all you have to do is just a kick flip and i just have to do a <laughs> kick flip and um i gave out boards that day and a little kid because i told him the you know og pumpkin thrashing raid make sure to follow us you know come to events one of the kids sent me a message and he was like He's like, thank you for coming out and doing what you did. He's like, that was the best day of my life. And I remember thinking like, some days it's kind of hard to get up and, and, and like, cause I'm like, fuck, I don't want to go do this. I'm going to do that. But that makes it worth it. Yeah. Right. Because no one told me, Hey, spend OG pumpkin money on buying boards and giving them out and nothing back. Right. I want to do it. Nobody told me to do that, but I want to do it cause I want to make a difference right and sometimes i don't know if i'm making a difference and when someone like that tells me it hits home because i know that's real because i used to be that kid yeah. and if i had been at a park and some dude in a uniform fucking started doing kickflips and was like here's a fucking board that would have been the best day of my life because those kids the in those areas year after year it just keeps it's the same thing yeah and i'm tired of politicians saying that they care about the community i'm tired about this and this and celebrities saying they give a shit about this uh, i rather take action and i'm trying to do the best that i can to help low-income communities i did last year it was heavy for veterans and i still care about the veteran community but this year i've been focusing more on on low-income communities because yeah. that's where i came from that's who i am a lot of who I am will forever be that kid who grew up poor, you know, seeing his mom break down two packets of top ramen and being like, this is what we're feeding all six of us. Yeah. Or me asking them what's dinner and they're like, there's no food, you know, or, or correction, not even asking what's for dinner because I know there's no food. Yeah. You know, so I'm just trying to just yeah. do that, you know. I mean, I see you. I think a lot of people are seeing you now and hearing you. Uh, it takes a lot to be able to be what you didn't have for somebody else and not be around to see the effects of that. Whoever that kid is that told you that, uh, somewhere far off in the future, we're not going to witness it. He's going to blow some minds, probably, maybe. You know, who knows? You never know. Like, um, invest in people is one of the things I say constantly. Mm -hmm. you know, I think you, you're doing a, like an amazing service to a lot of people out there and a lot of investments. Um, you're planting a lot of seeds and hopefully one day we can see you know, the outcroppings of a forest out there. And I, I appreciate it. You know, this yeah. does a big thing for me because it, it makes me a, a bigger audience know about who I am and what I'm doing. Because the reality is, just even in the, in the special operations community, all the dudes who are famous and big don't have my upbringing yeah. they don't look like me in from color to size to everything yeah um so i can touch and relate to other communities that they can't yeah and if they try they'll never get through because they're not from there 
right? And and Mike is the one who who taught me and understand me that you know and 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 people hear all this that I'm doing, but it's not me. It's the collection of the great leadership and mentors that I've had and I've just taken from them, like Mike, like Hugo Vanderwall, like Celise, you know, all of them taught me all this so this yeah. isn't this isn't like a me thing it's a collection of everyone who i've looked up to and still look up to and this is what happens when good people with not wanting wanting to do something put their their information and their lessons learned and stuff like that in other people yeah so become what they were for you you know that's a great purpose you know awesome um thank you for coming on oh. this is a great conversation uh I really appreciate what you're doing out there. I witnessed you. I see you. I know what you're doing. That's why I wanted to invite you on. Um, and also, uh, let's go get some bomb ass tacos. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Tijuana right now. So why not? Yeah. So we're going to go hang out for a bit. And if people want to see some of that, I think they're going to need to find you on social media. So where can they find you on social media? So, man, well, it's going to be kind of hard. Oh. Because I'm starting to get shadow banned. Oh, oh, we, we're 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 part of the shadow yeah. band crew, you know. Well, you you've been it. I I'm just barely feeling it. Like I remember hearing hearing people like you talk about shadow band or 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 Mike Lover or or somebody, you know. And I remember thinking like, man, that sucks. I think there's a few things happening. Uh, there's a mass exodus from Instagram to TikTok, um, and also Instagram has some squirrely algorithms and, yeah you know you uh like news content gets reported on my news feed you know so yeah it's like uh it's insane so that's what's happening uh for people wanting to find out more about you your projects uh og pumpkin where can they find you uh they can find me on instagram uh i have a youtube channel called ranger cortez the the Instagram for OG Pumpkin is the underscore OG underscore pumpkin. And then my personal one is Angel G Cortez, uh, 175, Cortez with an S. Um, there are some fake accounts up there, so make sure to, to follow the right one. We'll put the links up too. Awesome. And uh, the company I work for, uh, Defense Strategies Group, uh, just complete Defense Strategies Group. We're based out of LA. Come, come out. Um, because of DSG, it's allowed me not to touch OG Pumpkin Money, which has allowed me to do more for the community. So, awesome. And uh, Thrash and Raid, which is uh, my uh, official skateboard company sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Shout out to Thrash and Raid. Um, awesome. Awesome. <laughs>